Well, hi there, it's Paul Logan, and I'm going to be talking to you about cardiovascular examination, which is one of my favorite things to talk about, although I do have a lot. So just to refresh your memory very quickly, there are essentially two circulations in the heart. There's the right-sided circulation and the left-sided circulation. And so the superior and inferior vena cavae, uh, or vena cavas, if you're American, um, they return the blood to the right atrium. Then through the tricuspid valve goes the blood into the right ventricle. The right ventricle then pumps it out through the pulmonic valve. You can say pulmonary valve, but the cool kids say pulmonic valve. And then out to the pulmonary artery, where it splits into the left and right, well, the right and left pulmonary arteries. Then it goes to the lungs and into the capillaries and then into the pulmonary veins where it comes back to the left atrium then. The pulmonary veins bring the blood back to the left atrium. It sits in the left atrium, goes through the mitral valve then into the left ventricle and then the left ventricle pumps it out through the aortic valve out to the systemic circulation through the aorta. You all knew that. In the neck, there's uh, some anatomy that I think is important to remember. Um, most importantly, what I want you to remember is that the internal jugular vein, the one that we're really concerned with when we're looking at the neck veins, is buried behind the sternocleidomastoid here. So don't get excited when you see this vein uh full of blood because this is the external jugular vein and it can fill up with blood for a variety of reasons. Um, the internal jugular vein is the one that we're really interested in and notice most of it is hidden. So when we see the internal jugular pulsations, we can see it through this, um, but when we see it all the way up to the angle of the jaw, that's particularly concerning. Uh, if they're sitting upright, and we'll talk more about that later. Then the carotid is here. Notice that you will often see pulsations in the neck here um, that are the carotids. So we'll talk about how to differentiate um, arterial from venous pulsations. So if you understand these two pictures, you understand everything you need to really figure out what's going on on your physical exam. So we're going to start with this big fancy one here. And across this axis, the x-axis is time, right? So this is the first heart sound, second heart sound, first heart sound, second heart sound. The first thing that happens during the cardiac cycle, and of course we can start anywhere, but let's start with the QRS complex. The QRS complex of the EKG is essentially ventricular contraction. And during ventricular contraction, the aortic valve close, or the AV valves close, right? The mitral and tricuspid valves close. And as the ventricular contraction continues, the pressure inside the ventricle continues to increase. That's the red line that we're looking at here. As that pressure increases, eventually the pressure in the ventricle will exceed the pressure in the aorta, and that, may, that makes the aortic valve open. Okay. Now the pressure in the ventricle continues to increase and it forces blood out of the ventricle into the aorta until such time as the aortic valve closes. And that begins this period of isovolumic relaxation where the pressure in the aorta is higher than the pressure in the ventricle until the uh, AV valves close. I'm sorry, the AV valves open, forcing the blood from the atria into the ventricles passively. Passively. The only reason the blood flows into the ventricle is because the pressure in the, um, the pressure in the atria is greater than the pressure in the ventricles. And that's why the mitral and tricuspid valves have opened. Okay, you can see the pressure gradient is not that big, right? This is the pressure in the atria, this dotted line. The red is the pressure in the ventricle. So there's not a great gradient there. There's not a big difference. 
then the whole process starts all over again. But the important things to remember here are S1 forms by closure of the mitral and tricuspid valves. AV here stands for uh, atrioventricular valves. That's the mitral and the tricuspid. Okay, mitral valve closes slightly earlier than the tricuspid valve because the depolarization of the ventricle of the left ventricle happens before the right. And then there's this period of isovolumic contraction. And once the pressure in the ventricle becomes higher than the pressure in the aorta, the aortic valve opens. That's really important to understand when we're talking about differentiating AS from MR or aortic stenosis from mitral regurgitation. All right, but let's keep going. When the aortic valve closes, that's the second heart sound. Okay. Now, when there's passive ventricular filling from the atria, it's because the pressure in the H in the atria is higher than the pressure in the ventricles. But if there's a ton of blood in there, like a huge volume of blood, that makes a sound when it goes in. We call that the third heart sound or an S3. Okay. And then if ventric if atrial contraction uh, happens and the blood is ejected into a non-compliant, real stiff thick heart, then it makes a sound also. And it's not pictured here, but right here is where we see the fourth heart sound. It's a pre-systolic uh, pre sound, happens during diastole, but right before systole. And that um, is the sound of blood emptying from the atrium into the ventricle. It makes a sound, we call that the fourth heart sound. Okay, good. So listen to that a couple times understand all those um, little tidbits that I gave you because once you get that sunk into your head, all of these physical exam findings are going to make total sense to you. Okay. Now over on this side, it's important to look at the pressures. Know that the pressures on the right side of the heart are much, much lower than the pressures on the left side of the heart. So the pressures on the right side in the right atrium are zero. Essentially, the central venous pressure is nothing, okay? So the right atrial pressure is the central venous pressure, uh, and that pressure is zero to four-ish, something around there. Now, all of you critical care nurses and heart surgery ICUs, you're probably thinking, well, the right atrial pressure is less than 15, I'm happy. Well, okay, but in a normal heart that's not in your ICU, a normal right atrial pressure is nothing, all right, or next to nothing. When the pressure in the right atrium exceeds the pressure in the ventricle, then the pressure uh, gradient opens up this valve, and now the right ventricular pressure is about four, you know, zero to four, somewhere around there. And that four now in diastole becomes 25 when the ventricle contracts and that sends it out through the pulmonic valve to the pulmonary artery. Again, the peak pressure here is 25 or so, but now when the valve closes, the diastolic, instead of being four or nothing, is going to be 10. That's important. Keep that number in mind. 10 is the pulmonary artery diastolic pressure. Now the blood goes to the lungs and gets oxygenated and dumps off all of its CO2 and goes to the left atrium. And now we have all of this left atrial blood coming in here. Look what the pressure is. It's 10, right? The left atrial pressure is the same as the pulmonary artery pressure, both 10. Now the mitral valve opens and the blood dumps into the left ventricle. Look what the pressure in diastole is. It's 10. Check it out. The pulmonary artery diastolic pressure is about the same as the left atrial pressure, which is about the same as the number one most important pressure indicating the preload on the heart, the left ventricular end diastolic pressure. They're all the same. Okay. Then the blood pumps out through the uh, from the left ventricle through the aortic valve into the systemic circulation. So what's the pressure there? It's the systemic pressure, right? 120 over 80, hopefully. And hopefully you learn 
that the ideal blood pressure is less than 120 over less than 80 in people who are under 70 or so. Less than 120 over less than 80 is what we're going for. All right, but that's a different lecture. So let's talk about the cardiovascular exam. If there's nothing else that I impress upon you today, I want you to understand that you should know what you're going to hear by the time you get your stethoscope machine out of your pocket. The cardiovascular exam is not about heart sounds, all right? It's taking all the information that you know and concluding what the problem is before you even listen to the heart. You don't even need your stethoscope most times. Okay, it's confirmatory. So why do I say that? Well, because the history tells you everything you need to know. Then you're going to do some things with the physical exam first. You're going to look at the carotids. You're going to look at the neck veins. You're going to look at the precordial pulsations. And then you're going to pull out your stethoscope machine and listen to the heart. Oh, look, that's the order that I put here. All right. History and physical or the history and general appearance first, then the neck veins, then the carotids, then the precordial pulsations, then you pull out your stethoscope and listen. Do it in that order, you don't even need the stethoscope because you're going to know what the diagnosis is by the time you get there. For instance, with aortic stenosis, which is um, the valve lesion that you will hear most often in older adults in the United States, the aortic valve narrows and that causes this pressure overload on the left ventricle makes it harder to eject the blood out to the systemic circulation and so the things that go along with that are angina or angina if you want to be cool about it dyspnea which is shortness of breath right and dizziness or syncope so those are the three things that we're looking for in aortic stenosis. So if your patient gives you a history of, you know, I've been slowing down over the years and I, you know, get short of breath when I go up and down the stairs. And the other day I was outside cutting the grass and I got dizzy and thought I was going to faint. Pretty good chance that in an older adult that this sounds like it may be aortic stenosis. But now you can use physical exam findings. Well, I'm going to look at the neck veins. The neck veins are normal because the right side of the heart should be fine, right? This is a left-sided problem and only very, very, very late in the disease would you notice or expect to notice any right-sided um, problems. You'll feel the carotid pulse. So up until now, I'm trying to think, you know, do I have coronary disease that's causing dizziness and lightheadedness? Unlikely. That's a weird presentation. But the shortness of breath, are they in heart failure? Are they having coronary disease? But now I'm going to feel the carotid upstroke and I notice it's diminished. It's parvus et tardis, right? And now I know that that pulse is diminished and now I know my diagnosis because that tells me that it's probably aortic stenosis. So what else would I expect? Well, when I feel the heart, I'm going to expect that it's going to be big and hypertrophied, right? Well, that's what we're looking for next. We're going to feel a pre-systolic impulse at the LV uh, when we feel on the chest at the PMI. And we're also going to feel a diffuse and sustained PMI because a thick heart muscle gives you those findings. Now I'm going to listen and I'm going to hear a fourth heart sound. I don't even have to worry about the murmur. I know what this problem is now. But while I'm there, I'm going to listen to the murmur. And look what happens. There's a period of time after the first heart sound until this diastolic, uh, until this systolic crescendo decrescendo murmur happens this period of time this by the way this murmur should start with the ejection sound here this e1 that you see this should actually start back here further but this flow murmur that we hear this sounds like lub stub lub stub lub stub lub stub that that um classic murmur happens in aortic stenosis and it happens after the first heart sound. Doesn't start at the same time as the first heart sound. There's a slight delay there. Hint. Um, uh, period of isovolumic contraction. That's why there's a delay there. Okay. 
All right, back to the lesson. So there's a slight delay from the first heart sound until the beginning of the murmur, and then it's a crescendo, decrescendo. Whoosh, 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 that sound. All right, so that's just a for example for you. Let's go back and talk about the history, because I said the history and the general appearance, very important findings, right? The history, what sort of things are we trying to get from a, a cardiovascular history? Well, we talked about three of those symptoms, angina, dyspnea, uh, and then dizziness or syncope. Palpitations are another one. Fatigue is another one. That's the worst. If you have a patient, uh, if your patient listing for the day has a patient that has fatigue on it, um, call out sick that day because it's a pain. Fatigue is the one complaint I hate to try and figure out because there's a gazillion things that could cause it, right? But it's what we do. Along with the dyspnea, I want you to know about these two things, orthopnea and PND. They're not the same thing. Orthopnea is needing to sleep with the head of the bed up. In heart failure, you'll hear this kind of story. Yeah, two weeks ago or so, I started having more shortness of breath with exertion. Then I noticed that I had to use extra pillows in bed. And finally, for the last three days, I've had to sleep in a recliner because I can't sleep at night. That's the classic heart failure presentation. That's orthopnea. When you're flat, you can't breathe, so you use extra pillows or you raise the head of the bed. And finally, the pressure in the... Um, Pulmonary vascular, vasculature gets so high that it forces the fluid out, and that is heart failure, okay? The other symptom here is PND, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. It's my favorite symptom, because when you hear the story of PND, you're done. You don't have to get any more information from them in the history. You know... We're dealing with heart failure. That's it. Has to be. So here's the way it works. Patient's laying there. They're sound asleep. They're dreaming about, I don't know, whatever. Lambs jumping over a fence, whatever they're dreaming about. And suddenly in the middle of the night, they wake up short of breath, gasping for air. They sit on the side of the bed. They can't breathe for, ready for this part? This is important, 20 minutes. It has to be 20 minutes. Can't be two minutes. 20 minutes. What's happening here is that while the patient's sound asleep, the uh, pressures in the pulmonary vasculature are increasing to the point where fluid now leaks out into the interstitial space and they suddenly develop heart failure. That fluid is in the interstitial space. They can't breathe. The only way for them to normalize those pressures is to sit up, taking the pressure off of the pulmonary vasculature just from gravity, and now... After a 20-minute interval, that fluid goes back from the interstitial space back into the intravascular space. That's PND. That only happens with heart failure, okay? When you hear the description of PND, you're done. It's my favorite. I love it. Okay? Then we have the feeling of palpitations that we didn't talk about. Palpitations can be... Um, uh, palpitations, the definition is the, the uh, feeling of your heart beating. That can mean just that they feel their normal heartbeat, which I can. I kind of, I don't know, it's reassuring to me. I'm glad my heart's beating. I'm very appreciative of that. I can feel it, but it's not a problem. If my heart beats really slowly, and I feel that, that's palpitations. If my heart skips a beat and I feel that, that can be palpitations. If I feel my heart racing, that can be palpitations. All right. So just know that palpitations is a generic term. You need to do some more work to figure out what's what from there. Okay. We're going to start our physical exam with the, uh, after the history, we're going to start the physical exam by, uh, checking the carotid arteries or the femoral arteries or whatever arteries you choose, but the carotids are convenient. They're right there. They're exposed. You can usually feel them very easily and you can feel these uh, specific things that we're looking for. They're close to the heart 
as opposed to the radial arteries, which are way far away. And some of these things are going to extinguish by the time that the blood pressure gets, or by the time the pulse gets way down to the radial arteries. So we're going to use the carotid arteries. We'll inspect them. We'll look for the palp or for the um, uh, pulsations. And then we're going to palpate the carotids and we're going to feel the upstroke. Then we're going to listen and hear if we hear any sounds. All right. So there's, I call these the pulses, et cetera's, just as a joke. There's like, uh, it feels like there's 50 of them and I got to keep them all in my mind and I can't remember them, right? There's parvus et tardis, there's pulses alternans, pulses bispharens, and pulses paradoxus. Again, the pulses, et cetera's. So the normal upstroke looks like this. You have a nice full upstroke, um, normal pressure. Essentially, it just feels like a good normal pulse, and you've felt that a million times, hopefully, so you know what that is. This is the pressure tracing from an art line, so it shows the, um, uh, the this thing. What's the name of it? I forget. I just said it, and now I can't remember it. The uh, dichronic notch. So you're not going to feel the dichronic notch, but it's pictured here because... I don't know. Those are the only tracings I can find. Parvus et tardis is a diminished pulse pressure, a real delayed upstroke. So after you've felt a million normal carotid pulses and you feel this, you'll notice that it just feels like it's taking extra long to get to the peak. And it feels like it's just not as vigorous of an upstroke. Um, you'll get to know this. This is parvus et tardis. Okay. This is seen in severe aortic stenosis. It's seen in some heart failure, systolic heart failure. It's seen in hypovolemia, um, but especially in aortic stenosis. A bispharens pulse is seen in uh, aortic regurgitation. So what happens is the aorta gets filled, right? The ventricle contracts, sends the blood into the aorta. The aortic valve leaks, and so now it falls back into the ventricle, and now there's this sensation of a second impulse, okay? So this second impulse is the bispharens pulse. Again, we see it in aortic regurgitation or aortic insufficiency, same thing. Um, and we also see it in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, and then we have pulsus alternans. You know, this is a bad thing, right? This is severe decompensated left ventricular failure um, where the amplitude of the pulse alternates beat to beat. So you get a high amplitude, low amplitude, high amplitude, low amplitude. And that's just because the ventricle's failing and you can't, you, you know, you just can't fix it. So now this is the pulsus paradoxus. Critical care nurses, remember that you're used to dealing with somebody on a ventilator, which is positive pressure ventilation, which means that these things are reversed, right? So you probably have learned that when you're getting your fresh post-op heart back, that if we see uh, an increase of uh, 10 millimeters of mercury during inspiration, that, uh, or... Uh, I should say in excess of 10 millimeters, that that's pulses paradoxus, right? Well, forget that. We're talking about normal patients without a ventilator. So normally you and I sitting here talking, well, I'm doing the talking, but whatever. My uh, normal systolic pressure may decrease 10 millimeters of mercury with inspiration. Okay. If I have pericardial tamponade, it may decrease more than 10 millimeters of mercury, all right? Now, that seems weird. Why do they call that paradoxical? Well, it's not really paradoxical, is it? Paradoxical would mean that if it went the other way, but I don't know why they call it that, but the, the reality is that more than 10 millimeter decrease in systolic blood pressure is pulsus paradoxus. And that means that there's something obstructing um, venous filling, I'm sorry, ventricular filling, uh, and that is usually an acute or chronic accumulation of blood in the pericardial space. Let's talk about jugular veins. There's so much information that we can learn from the venous pulsations. 
When we look at venous pulsations, we're looking for A waves and V waves. Why A waves and V waves? Well, because there's two venous pulsations for every cardiac cycle, if you're in sinus rhythm. So the first venous wave that we see, sorry, is the A wave. And the A wave is essentially caused by atrial contraction, okay? Although this is a little more involved and this doesn't necessarily correlate, um, what I'm telling you doesn't, isn't 100% accurate, the uh, atrial or the A wave happens when atrial contraction occurs and the V wave happens when ventricular contraction occurs, all right? It's a little more nuanced than that, but I don't want to get into that. For our purposes, let's just assume that ventricular contraction causes the V wave. Now, what does that tell you? Well, if the patient is in atrial fibrillation, there's not going to be right atrial contraction, right? So there's not going to be an A wave. There's a whole bunch of other things that we can see, though. When we can see, for instance, tricuspid regurgitation, um, we see these giant V waves, giant V waves, because the ventricle is contracting and it's pumping blood at a higher pressure into the right atrium, backward through the tricuspid valve, right? So that's one thing that can happen. We can see giant V waves. We could also see cannon A waves. Can and A waves happen in problems like tricuspid stenosis, which we never see in adults, or we see it in complete AV block. This is kind of cool. If you're thinking about the um, atria and the ventricles contracting not in unison, like happens in complete heart block, um, the atria and the ventricle may sometimes contract simultaneously. And if that happens, the when the ventricle contracts, the tricuspid valve closes, and so the atrial contraction will mean the blood doesn't have anywhere to go. So you'll see this giant A, this cannon A wave that happens. So there's all sorts of great information that you can get from these jugular waveforms, but I'll be happy if you can just measure how high they are. So here's how you do that. And this is the way my old professor, Barbara Bates, Dr. Bates told me how to do it. I was supposed to put the head of the bed at 30 to 45 degrees, put on some light jazz music, dim the lights, pour some wine. Like it was this whole milieu that you're supposed to create so that you can get the lighting right so you can see the pulsations in the neck and yada, yada, yada. Big pain in the neck, right? Just a huge amount of work to get this information. So let's just jump to this information. If you put the patient on the bed, on the side of the bed, or the exam table or whatever, and they're straight up and down, 90 degrees like this patient is. Look for the neck veins. If you don't see them, normal JVP, right? Because what's a normal, uh, what's the normal jugular venous pressure? The normal right atrial pressure? It's like zero to four or something like that, right? So if I don't see the neck veins when they're sitting up and the right atrium is I don't know, 14 centimeters below the clavicle, 12, 14 centimeters, depending, um, then that's 12 to 14 centimeters of water, which is the units that we measure the uh, jugular venous pressure in, right? So if I don't see any neck veins with the patient sitting up on the side of the bed, it's normal. Done. Go home. You don't have to do anything else. If we see neck veins, then measure the distance from the clavicle, actually from the sternal notch, um, and measure that distance. The distance from the right atrium to the sternal notch is allegedly 10 centimeters. I don't know if how accurate that is, but that's what we do. We measure and add 10 um, uh, from the top of the clavicle, it's like 14 usually. So we measure the distance from the sternal notch, the vertical distance from the sternal notch to the top of the jugular veins, and that's what the venous pressure is done. Okay? That's something that's easier to demonstrate in the lab than it is to listen to me talk about it, but 
the most important point is that you're usually not going to see neck veins when you have somebody seated like this, in which case the jugular venous pressure is normal. Now we're going to look at the heart. We can inspect the chest and note any pulsations. Notice scars. There are any number of physical exams that have been ruined by missing the median sternotomy incision on the chest, right? It's kind of an important thing to uh, discuss when you're presenting the case to the cardiologist or whoever you're presenting to. Don't miss the surgical scars. Next, we're going to palpate the heart. We can look for lifts and heaves and all sorts of things, but the thing that we're really interested in most times for the average adult patient is the PMI, all right? Notice any thrills because a thrill you need in order to have a grade four, five, or six murmur, right? You cannot have a grade four, five, or six murmur without a thrill. I've only felt thrills a few times in my entire career, so I'm always writing down a grade two or three systolic murmur, right? Or whatever murmur. Thrills are rare. We see them uh, with VSDs quite a bit where the pressures are really high and they're moving a lot of blood turbulently uh, and that makes a, a buzzing uh, feel. So look, feel for thrills, okay? And again, we'll talk about thrills when we talk about murmur grading. But the PMI should be at the fifth intercostal space midclavicular line, right? This is his midclavicular line. So right here, just, just medial to the nipple is where you should feel the um, PMI, right about there at the fifth intercostal space, right? So you're gonna feel from up here, from the clavicle, you're gonna go down and feel the first intercostal space, second, third, fourth, fifth, and then follow that rib around and you'll feel the fifth intercostal space right here at the midclavicular line. When we feel it there and it's normal, it just comes up and taps the hand, good, that's all you need to know. If it's diffuse and sustained, right, if it's the size of a quarter instead of the size of a dime, and if it reaches up and touches your hand and keeps it there for a, a split second, then that's what we call diffuse and sustained. Now, if the PMI is really felt over here in the armpit or lateral to this PMI location, this normal PMI location, then we refer to that as laterally displaced. And that's important to know because we have to distinguish what kind of heart we're feeling. Is it a big, thick, hypertrophic heart? Is it a big, boggy, uh, dilated heart? Those are the things that we're interested in. All right, these are the things that we're feeling for, lifts and heaves. We can feel um, aortic things here. We can feel pulmonic things here, but usually we're just listening there. We um, can feel the right ventricle heaving uh, here. We can feel the PMI right here at the left ventricular apex. All right, that's the PMI. I wanted to just show you this lateral chest x-ray. Notice that what we're feeling um, when we have our hand right here is not the left ventricle. It's the right ventricle. The right ventricle is what we feel here. And the left ventricle doesn't become apparent until we get down to the apex. So, um, so here we're feeling right ventricle. Here we're feeling left ventricle. Okay. This is an example of, uh, as a very good example of an EKG showing left ventricular hypertrophy. This is the most sensitive uh, lead here. So when we see, I'm sorry, this is the most specific in AVL. When we see 11 millivolts, that's 11 uh, of these little boxes um, in the R wave, that is the most specific finding for, um, for LVH. So AVL, 11 millivolts, uh, that is the most specific finding. But here we also see huge um, uh, S wave here and a huge R wave here. And we see this lateral ST abnormality here. Uh, we also see some higher um, um, amplitudes here. So this is LVH. We can also look here and see this um, major negative terminal component of the P wave in V1. 
that indicates left atrial enlargement. And that, along with the strain pattern, along with the voltage criteria, this is left ventricular hypertrophy. Now, I want you to know the difference between hypertrophy and dilation, right? We sometimes both refer to them as big heart, but they're very different big. This is hypertrophied, right? So let's start with what's normal. This is what a normal ventricle looks like. And so we can see this about this thickness here in the lateral wall or what we call the free wall. Well, look here in this free wall. This is hugely dilated. Like this is a bag of a heart, all right? This left ventricular free wall, we can't even, we can't even measure it so thin. Here, this left ventricular free wall is so thick, we can't measure it because it's so thick, right? This is ventricular hypertrophy, super thick muscle. That's very different than dilated. So make sure you understand that if this is new to you, all right? Dilated means that uh, the chamber is very large. See how large that chamber is, that vertical, dis or that... Um, side to side distance here this chamber is tiny and when it contracts this obliterates there's no chamber left when this contracts it may get to here and here and you know that indicates that they have an ejection fraction of you know i don't know 10 20 percent whatever depends i mean we're not seeing it but next you're going to assess the pmi the pmi is where the ventricle touches the wall of the chest Okay. To feel this, the only way that you should be able to feel it is with the patient laying on their left side, slightly on their left side, and then you put your hand, um, put the ball of your hand, you know, right where your fingers meet the palm of your hand, put that part at the uh, fifth intercostal space midclavicular line, and we're looking for a dime-sized uh, impulse that reaches up, touches the chest wall, and then releases right away. And that's a normal PMI, fifth ICS MCL, dime sized, size of the fingertip, touches the chest wall and then goes away. All right. When you find a diffuse and sustained PMI, that's like a, the size of a quarter at the fifth intercostal space, mid clavicular line, Often there's a pre-systolic impulse, so it sounds like this. Da, 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 da. Instead of the normal, da, da, da. this is da, 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 da. that's the pre-systolic impulse. That's really a fourth heart sound. And then you feel the diffuse and sustained PMI during ventricular contraction. Okay? That's different from the laterally displaced kind of mushy feel that you get with left ventricular dilation. When the ventricle dilates, it sends the PMI way over to the side of the chest and, um, and it's just like a mushy kind of feel that you get with the heart. All right. We did all that stuff. Now you probably already know the diagnosis when you're, in, when you're examining the patient. We're going to keep listening. So um, the guy who taught me about cardiovascular physical exam was a guy named Proctor Harvey. And he's dead now. I think uh, he died around 97 or so, uh, 1997. And he was about that age, too. He was, a, he was 90 or so when he died. Um he invented the stethoscope and it had three heads to it. And he famously, this one, by the way, was a amplifying head. So it was cool. You had the bell down here, you had the diaphragm here, and then you had this amplifying diaphragm. Um, and he used to say, if you carry a three headed stethoscope, no one will ever question what you hear. I love that. I just love that. It was great. It's important that you know how to use your stethoscope machine, right? Because many of you I have seen at the hospital, uh, and by you, I mean nurses practicing at the hospital who have one of these stethoscopes like this, or 
they have this kind of stethoscope and they have um, a diaphragm here and a diaphragm here. Well, guess what? Unless you have a bell like this, all right, unless you have a bell on your stethoscope, you're never going to hear low pitch sounds like S3s. Did you know you're supposed to use the bell of the stethoscope to take a blood pressure? I bet you never knew that. But it's a low, the Karatkov sounds are low pitch sounds. You're supposed to use the bell of your stethoscope for that. And then there's this diastolic rumble that you'll never hear because it's so low pitched. It, you'll just never hear it. And if you miss it, you're going to miss somebody with severe mitral regurgitation. So get a stethoscope that has a bell. And if it comes with two diaphragms on it, throw it away. You need the bell. You cannot do a proper cardiovascular exam without a bell. Now, if you're fancy schmancy like me and you're one of those snooty cardiology people like me, then you may have one of these. This is the this is like a knockoff of the uh, master cardiology stethoscope that Whitman makes. But it's, I don't know, $300 stethoscope. I think you can get it for under $200. Um, but it has what we call a floating head diaphragm, which is kind of cool because it has a little hole in the middle. So when you're looking at buying your stethoscope, if you have uh, uh, a diaphragm on the stethoscope and it has a little hole in the middle and it moves when you touch it, that's fine. That's a floating head diaphragm. That's the fancy schmancy kind. And that will hear low pitch sounds when you touch it lightly to the chest but forming a seal with the skin. And when you push firmly on the chest, it turns it into a, a diaphragm. All right, that works, it's cool. So we're gonna start by figuring out systole. The first thing you have to do is feel, uh, is listen for systole. And you know systole is the lub in lub dub, right? Now, where do you hear the heart sounds best well remember you hear the aortic valve and the pulmonic valve best up here but that's not where you hear the first heart sound right you hear the first heart sound best here actually at the mitral site because it's louder than the pulmonic than the tricuspid site so the mitral site is the best place to hear the first heart sound so to get your exam started i recommend that you start down here after you get experience, you'll be able to start up here and start from the top. But listen here to hear the first heart sound. It's the loudest one. Lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. If you listen up here, it's going to sound like lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. Because you won't hear the lub sound very much from the first heart sound down here because you're listening at the wrong place. Okay? So listen to S1 first. Lub dub, lub dub. Then listen for the second heart sound. Lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. Listen up here if you want. Lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. It's actually going to be loudest at the aortic site, right? Uh, at the aortic site is where it should be the loudest, not the pulmonic site. You'll listen for the first and second heart sounds. Listen if you hear any other regular sounds. If you hear uh, a sound after the second heart sound, that's a third heart sound, perhaps. It may be a mid-systolic click that you're mishearing. It may be a fourth heart sound if it comes before, if it sounds like da lub dub da lub dub da lub dub All right. Listen for clicks and other sounds in the middle, then listen for the systolic murmurs, then diastolic murmurs. All right. And someday you'll be able to listen to all of them at once. But when you're Getting started, listen first for these. Remember that the sound that you hear most prevalently down here is the mitral component because the mitral valve closes a little earlier and it's uh, the pressures are higher, so it's a little louder. Uh, at the base of the heart, this is the apex, this is the base. At the base of the heart, we hear the aortic sound best because the aortic valve closes slightly before the pulmonic valve. And then it also has the higher pressures associated with it. So that's going to make it louder, right? 
All right. Then after you figure all this stuff, you can use the ape to man method, right? Aortic, pulmonic, herbs point, tricuspid, mitral, ape, A-P-E, to man. That's the method that uh, people like you to use. I don't know. Whatever works for you. You'll come up with your own method. Follow that method every time the same way, and then you'll never miss anything. Listen with the diaphragm first at all the sites, then go back and listen with the bell at all the sites. You'll never hear, you'll never miss anything. The reason that we hear the aortic sound best here is that when the blood comes out through the aortic valve, it goes and is directed in that direction. The sound is directed in that direction, all right? Even though the blood's going this way, the blood is ejecting here and then it's turning, so the sound is coming this way. You may hear it best here, you may hear it best here, you know, it just varies. All right. Similarly, the mitral valve, you're going to hear best down here because the blood is coming this way. Sorry. The blood is coming this way. And that's why you hear the sounds through the mitral valve down here best. So S1, closure of mitral and tricuspid valves, heard best at the apex down here at four and five. Um, Here's a little party trick if you're interested. The intensity of the first heart sound varies inversely with the length of the PR interval. So when Proctor Harvey was demonstrating all this stuff at this course I went to, um, which was a, a four day, I think, cardiac exam course, like we went into some detail on this. Um, the So they put him up in front and he could tell you within a couple of milliseconds what the PR interval was just by listening to how loud the first heart sound was. It's kind of cool. The second heart sound, again, closure of the aortic and pulmonic valves. Um, when we hear splitting, we have to think about why it's splitting. So physiologically, when we take in a breath and we're not on positive pressure ventilation. When we take a breath, that is a negative inspiratory force. The pressure in the chest decreases, right? That's how you take a breath in because you have a vacuum in your chest that sucks the air into your lungs. So when we take a deep breath or any breath, um, the pressure in the chest is lower. That means the return of blood to the heart is increased, right? More blood flow coming back to the heart. That means that the pulmonic valve is closing slightly faster, which means that the um, during inspiration, those two... Wait, I, I messed that up. I'm sorry. I knew I was going to do that. During inspiration, those sounds split further because the lower pressure means that the volume is higher and the, uh, the, the volume in the right ventricle is higher. And that means that the flow through the pulmonic valve is going to be greater which means that it takes a little bit longer and it splits that second heart sound out further. During expiration, we're back to the normal pressures in the heart, right? And therefore, the flow through the pulmonic valve is less and the pressure, uh, I'm sorry, the timing fuses again so the aortic and the tr and the pulmonic valves close essentially together just memorize it when you have inspiration you have splitting of the second heart sound that is physiologic that's the way the chest is supposed to work when that reverses it's because the left bundle branch block causes it to reverse when the left bundle branch block happens, that means that the aortic valve closes slightly later. And so during inspiration, they will be fused. And during expiration, 
the tricuspid valve is going to be closing a little earlier than the aortic valve. And that means it splits during expiration. Okay. Again, these are party tricks. They're fun. I can amaze a lot of students when I do this and, you know, when we're examining somebody. I can say, this person has a left bundle branch block, I'll bet. And we look at the EKG and everybody's eyes get wide. They're like, wow, that's so cool. It's really, I just memorized this stuff and that's all there is to it. But it's cool. We can also have wide splitting of the, um, heart, of the second heart sound with a right bundle branch block. And that is a little harder to explain, but it has to do with that same timing that we see with, um, with inspiration. So during inspiration, we move the uh, aortic and pulmonic sounds further apart. And then during expiration, since there's a bundle branch block, that means that the depolarization happens later on the right side. And so they never really fuse together. They never really get back together again. So that's wide splitting with a right bundle branch block. We see something called wide fixed splitting in ASD. There is no murmur in atrial septal defect. We see instead wide fixed splitting of the second heart sound, okay? And we'll talk about the severe aortic stenosis later. I know that everybody learned this ridiculous rhyme thing that Kentucky and Tennessee, and that's how you tell S3 from S4. I don't know. They sound exactly the same to me. I don't know which one's which. So learn it this way. Learn to hear the cadence in your head to figure out S3 or S4. When you hear lub de boom, lub de boom, lub de boom, lub de boom, right? So it's lub dub and then a boom. Lub dub boom, lub dub boom, lub dub boom. But the cadence becomes lub de boom, lub de boom, lub de boom, lub de boom. That is the cadence of a third heart sound. That's what you hear when there's a third heart sound. You'll only hear it with the bell of the stethoscope and you'll only hear it over the PMI, but that's how you hear it. And that's the cadence that you're listening for. You listen with the bell of the stethoscope, lub de boom lub de boom And then you press firmly with the bell or listen with the diaphragm and it goes lub dub lub dub lub dub Listen again with the bell, lub de boom lub de boom lub de boom that's how you make the diagnosis of a third heart sound. That's volume overload. That's um, because of passive ventricular filling. There's such a volume of blood in the left atrium that as soon as the mitral valve opens, it falls in and makes a sound, makes a thud or a boom in this case. A fourth heart sound is different. A fourth heart sound happens because of atrial contraction. So remember, don't fall for this trick. The guy you're rounding with says, hey, did you hear the fourth heart sound on that patient with AFib? No, I'm not falling for that because they don't have a fourth heart sound because they can't because they're in AFib, right? The fourth heart sound is caused by atrial contraction. And so when that atrium contracts, it forces the blood into a non-compliant ventricle, whether it's thick or fibrosed or stiff for other reasons, it's, um, it makes a sound. And that sound that it makes is pre-systolic, so it's a duh, and then lub-dub. Duh-lub-dub, duh-lub-dub, duh-lub-dub. That's the cadence to listen for. Lub-da-boom, S3, duh-lub-dub, S4, okay? And S3 is a bad sign. Indicates huge volume overload in the left ventricle. It's no good. You listen for it with the patient in the left lying position, left lateral position, I should say. It's very faint. You almost have to imagine it. Listen with the bell, lub de boom, lub de boom, lub de boom. Then listen with the diaphragm or push the bell firmly against the chest, lub dub, lub dub. Again, listen with the bell, lub de boom, lub de boom. That's how you hear it.
okay? It's so important to hear a third heart sound because it is the number one risk in the Goldman criteria for getting anesthesia. 11 points you get just for an S3 gallop. So we don't want to take people to the operating room, particularly for big operations that have fluid volume shifts like vascular surgery, um, if they have a third heart sound, if they're in heart failure. Okay. Fourth heart sound, the lub dub, the lub dub. It's pre-systolic caused by atrial contraction. The atria are contracting into non-compliant ventricles. That's a fourth heart sound. Okay. So there's this thing called a mid-systolic click. This is what we hear in mitral valve prolapse. Thankfully, we don't make the diagnosis of mitral valve prolapse very much anymore, but um, it is something that you may hear. And it doesn't sound like lub da boom lub da boom It doesn't sound like that. It sounds like lub da lub da lub da lub da It's too fast to be lub da boom lub da boom It's lub da lub da lub da It's this mid systolic thing that happens. It just sounds like a weird extra sound. And what's happening is this, um, this is the left ventricle. So the heart's sort of laying on its side in this picture. Um, this is the left ventricle. This is the aorta right here. This is the aortic valve. Then this is the left atrium and this is the mitral valve. So this is the anterior mitral leaflet. This is the posterior leaflet, but it's all um, bending backwards, right? So it should close like this but it's redundant, it's big and floppy, and it a bunch of it leaks backward into the left atrium, and it makes that sound when it does so. That mid-systolic clip, click, lub to it, lub to it, lub to it, lub to it. Okay? Then there's a pericardial friction rub. Remember this little um, thing. When we hear three components of the pericardial friction rub, the ventricular systole, the ventricular diastole, and the atrial systole sound, this scratching sound that we hear three different times during the cardiac cycle, that's a friction rub. Good to go. You can take that to the bank. We hardly ever hear all three of those, though. So usually we hear two components. But when you hear two components, you're not really sure that it's a friction rub. And if you only hear one component, it's probably a murmur. All right. We hear pericardial friction rubs and pericarditis and postpericardiotomy syndrome and those sorts of things. Um, by the way, just for people who care, uh, a really good um, understanding of uh, and a good identifying marker on EKGs for pericarditis is not really the ST elevation. So you see this generalized ST elevation here. You see it here in the um, anterolateral leads, you see that? And you see it here in the inferior leads, here in uh, two in AVF. We also see it in one in AVL. When you see that generalized ST elevation, that's indicative of pericarditis, but the real clincher is this um, depressed PR interval. That's the cool part that we see in this picture. Other sounds that you'll never hear, you'll never really be able to appreciate the ejection sound unless you've been doing this for a long, long time. Opening snaps for mitral stenosis are very, very hard to hear. I've heard a venous hum once. Uh, if you work in a pediatric population, you may see, uh, you may hear them more often. Um, ejection sounds I forgot to mention are what we, uh, that's the sound of a stenotic aortic valve opening. And that's what begins the uh, crescendo decrescendo murmur of aortic stenosis. All right, so let's just take a breath and think about the way that murmurs can happen. So we can have murmurs either because of pressure overloads, uh, or I should say for from stenotic lesions, where the increased pressure goes through a narrowed opening like aortic stenosis, and that makes a sound or we can have leaking of the valve that causes backward flow, all right? And that can mean that these sounds can happen either in systole or diastole. So think about the valve that you're listening to. 
think about the pathology. If you think about the aortic valve, when does blood go across the aortic valve normally? Well, during systole, right? Because the job of the aortic valve is to get blood from the ventricle into the aorta. That happens during systole because, like, I know that. That's just how that heart works. And so if I hear a systolic murmur at the aortic site that um, sounds like a crescendo, decrescendo, that's probably aortic stenosis. But if I'm listening at that same spot and I hear lub dub shh, lub dub shh, lub dub shh, lub dub shh, that's a diastolic murmur. Why would I hear diastolic murmurs at the aortic site? Well, that's because the blood's going backward through the aortic valve, right? It's not supposed to go through the aortic valve during diastole. The whole job of the aortic valve is to keep blood from moving during diastole. That's the job, right? So if there's blood moving through it during diastole, then uh, that's bad, right? We don't expect that. So what are the murmurs that we typically hear? Well, we can hear pulmonic flow murmurs. We hear them in kids. And that just happens because the pulmonary artery is so close to the chest wall in kids. Like in young kids under, I don't know, six, seven. I made that number up. But in young kids, the pulmonary artery is right behind the sternum i mean like right there you could you could kiss it it's that close so you can hear the flow through that pulmonary artery and that's just normal but as the patient ages as the child ages that aorta moves further and further or the pulmonary artery moves further and further away from the chest wall and you should no longer hear that uh, flow murmur from the pulmonary artery Aortic flow murmurs happen in high output situations. Pregnancy is the, a very common one. Hyperthyroidism is another common one. Hypertension, perhaps. Um, uh, hypovolemia, those kind of things can cause high flow. Anemia is another really big one. Uh, you may hear more flow across the, the, across the aortic valve because the heart has to work harder. Well, it's working harder in pregnancy because now you got to pump blood to two things, right? And it's working harder in anemia because you got to have the heart doing extra work to get enough oxygenated uh, cells to the uh, tissues. Makes sense, right? All right, good. Aortic sclerosis is the beginnings of aortic stenosis, and then aortic stenosis is narrowing of the aortic valve. Mitral regurgitation also is a um, systolic murmur, as is tricuspid regurgitation. And theoretically, um, pulmonic stenosis is a systolic murmur similar to aortic stenosis, but in adults, we don't see pulmonic stenosis. That's a kid thing. All right. The common diastolic murmurs that we hear are aortic regurgitation, by far the most common diastolic murmur that we hear in adults, and mitral stenosis uh, is another one that we can hear. That always goes along with rheumatic fever, always. I should say it this way. When we hear mitral stenosis, it's because of rheumatic fever. They had rheumatic fever. Um, not everybody with rheumatic fever develops mitral stenosis, but when we see MS, it is, uh, it is definitely because of um, rheumatic fever. Okay, so how do we describe these murmurs? Well, we can talk about their timing, systolic or diastolic, early diastolic, pan-systolic, like we can talk about all those things. Location, where do we hear it best? Do we hear it at the aortic site? Do we hear it at the left sternal border? Do we hear it at the apex? Does it go into the axilla? What's the, you know, where's the location? The quality of the murmur. Is it a blowing murmur? Is it a harsh murmur? Is it a musical murmur? We sometimes hear musical murmurs. Aortic stenosis can sound like hoot, 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 hoot. That's kind of cool. I only heard that once or twice. What's the shape of the murmur? Crescendo, decrescendo, diamond-shaped murmur, holosystolic, the same all the way through systole. What's the character? Is it harsh? Is it blowing? Is it, um, uh, is it soft? Is it loud? You know, those kind of things. What's the pitch? Is it high-pitched? Is it low-pitched? 
Uh, and then grade, we grade murmurs this way. A grade one murmur you can think of as barely audible. A grade two murmur is audible. Grade three, you better not miss it because it's definitely there. The difference between a three and four is a thrill, right? You have to be able to feel a palpable thrill in order to say that somebody has a grade four, five, or six murmur. You're not going to hear it very much. Maybe if they have an ASD, something like that. Um, uh, I'm sorry, a VSD, you may hear a grade four, five, or six murmur with a thrill. Uh, but we typically don't see a lot of those. So we talked about the common systolic murmurs. Um, let's talk about holosystolic murmurs. Um, mitral regurgitation being the most common of the holosystolic murmurs. Um, this happens all the way from the beginning of systole through the end of systole. And why does that happen? Well, because the mitral and tricuspid valves close as soon as ventricular contraction occurs. As soon as the ventricle begins to contract, the pressure in the ventricle is higher than the pressure in the, in the atria, and it closes the aortic or the um, AV valve, the either mitral or tricuspid valve. Okay? That means that you probably won't hear the first heart sound, right? Think about it this way. Mitral regurgitation. This is a uh, systolic murmur that's holo, uh, holosystolic or pansystolic. Happens all the way through systole. If the thing that causes the first heart sound is closure of the mitral valve, and you have leaking of the mitral valve, that means it's not closing, then you're not going to hear the first heart sound, right? Makes sense. Well, the other reason is that the, the murmur begins as soon as that valve ostensibly closes, right? As soon as ventricular contraction happens, that blood starts moving backwards. All right. A VSD, also it's harsh, heard throughout systole, uh, often associated with a thrill particularly the smaller VSDs. The smaller the VSD, think about it, if you have your finger over a garden hose, you turn the garden hose on, um, that jet squirts out really far. That's very turbulent. It's going to make a louder sound than if you just don't have your thumb over it. So giant VSDs don't usually make a lot of noise and don't often have a thrill associated with them. But, you know, that's sort of general guidance. That's not a hard, fast rule. Now we see flow murmurs too. So innocent murmurs are, they, they just sound innocent. They're not, they're not pathologic. They're not late peaking by any means. You always hear the second heart sound very well. And the flow really happens very quickly after S1. It goes uh, louder and then it gets softer. But aortic stenosis we listen and we see this, um, we hear the first heart sound very clearly, even at the aortic site. And then we hear this ejection sound, although you probably won't hear it. And then we hear the crescendo, decrescendo murmur. The louder the murmur is and the more harsh um, does not mean the more severe the stenosis, okay? What means the most severe stenosis is how late this peaks. If it peaks so late that it overtakes the second heart sound or the A2 component of the second heart sound, then that's severe aortic stenosis, right? We judge the severity of aortic stenosis by, how, by what we hear in systole. And if this systolic murmur takes so long to happen, that it peaks out here and then overtakes the second heart sound. That's really bad aortic stenosis. Makes sense, right? All right. One little trick to differentiate this murmur from this murmur is to listen for an extra beat. So the beat following a premature beat, not the premature beat, but the one after it, if you have aortic stenosis, it's going to sound louder 
that beat after the premature beat will be louder in aortic stenosis than in mitral regurgitation. So here's the way it'll sound. If you have aortic stenosis with a premature beat, it'll sound like this. Lub shh, lub shh, or I'm sorry, lub dub shh. No, wait, I got it this time. Lub shh dub, 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 lub shh dub. Lub stub, right? So it's lub stub, lub stub, lub stub, lub stub. Why does that happen? The beat after the premature beat, well, the premature beat doesn't have much blood in it because it's early. It didn't have enough time to fill the ventricle. So the amount of blood it's squirting out is very little. But the beat after that, it, there's a compensatory pause, right? So the beat after the premature beat has lots of time for ventricular filling. And now when it contracts, the volume is going to be a much greater volume of blood and it makes a louder sound. Here's what you hear with a premature beat in mitral regurgitation. Exactly the same. exactly the same no change in intensity okay hcm we're not going to talk about it too much i really want you to focus on mitral regurgitation and aortic stenosis because those are the ones that you're going to hear every day in your clinical practice all right but this changes with squatting it goes it, it gets less with squatting and it increases with a valsalva maneuver don't do it in the office. You'll make people pass out. You have to resuscitate them. It's very bad. So the diastolic murmur that we hear most commonly is aortic, regurg uh, aortic regurgitation. And it sounds like this. Lub stub. No, I'm sorry. Lub dub sh. Lub dub sh. Lub dub sh. Lub dub sh. And what's happening is the second heart sound, right? Not the first heart sound. The second heart sound is where the aortic valve closes. But if it's leaking, now it's going to leak backward into the ventricle until the ventricle is full. We judge the severity of aortic regurgitation by how long it takes for this uh, murmur to happen. So a longer murmur, less severe. If the hole is wide open, then that blood just falls right into the ventricle. Lub dub sh, lub dub sh, lub dub sh. That's very, very fast, severe aortic regurgitation. Lub dub sh, lub dub sh, lub dub sh. Much less severe, right? Hard to hear that. We get the echo. We use a function called the pressure half time to decide how severe it is, but. That's beyond the scope of this. Another diastolic murmur that you can hear, and I love hearing it, it's a fun murmur. Sucks for the person who has it, it's a bad disease, but um, but the, the murmur it sounds really fun. And again, it's diastolic, so it's after the second heart sound. Then you hear this opening snap, which is hard to hear. And then you hear it's sort of a musical kind of sound. So lub dub shroop, lub dub shroop, lub dub shroop, kind of like that. Almost like a barking kind of sound. Um, it's very, very unique. You'll never forget it once you hear it. All right, so I gave you this one of these hints before, but since you're most frequently going to hear systolic murmurs. And the most important thing for you to do is determine whether it's involving the aortic valve or the mitral valve. You're going to need to figure out how to do that. Well, here's my tricks for you. All right. Remember, aortic stenosis is diamond shaped or crescendo decrescendo. It's more intense after a premature beat. That's a huge one. And then in severe AS, you'll hear the second heart sound at the pulmonic site, left, uh, left sternal border, second intercostal space, more than at the right sternal border, all right? That is an indication of severe AS. The mitral regurgitation murmur is holosystolic. S1, you don't usually hear, 
and the intensity never changes, right? With the uh, with a premature beat, the beat or the murmur following the premature beat is a crescendo decrescendo and it'll get more intense. When you hear mitral regurgitation, it never changes in intensity. We already talked about that. All right. So if you can get an extra heartbeat, that is very, very, very helpful in determining uh, severe uh, I'm sorry, AS versus mitral regurgitation. All right. Let us talk about the peripheral vascular system. Essentially, a careful history is always important. We're going to look at uh, skin, note the temperature, the color, note any lesions that you see. This can be very helpful uh, in figuring out what's going on in the peripheral vascular system. Um, pulses are the most important part of assessing the peripheral vascular system um, or the peripheral arterial system, I should say. And then there's other things. And, you know, we argue about uh, how important um, uh, capillary refill is. You know, just because you have capillary refill does not mean that you have good perfusion of the tissue. That's very important to remember. We learned about capillary refill. Nurses love it. Nursing students, I should say, love it because it's easy to see and it's demonstrable and you can show it off and say, look, it's here. But just having that um, refill does not mean that you have good perfusion of the limb. So it's helpful. It's one piece of the puzzle, but it's not the entire piece. Upper extremities um, rarely get arterial disease. It's kind of fun, right? Isn't it interesting that even in smokers um, with terrible vascular disease, we hardly ever see upper extremity vascular disease. It's just weird. Um, remember that the anatomy off of the aorta is different on the right and the left. So on the right side, we have this um, shared vessel that gives rise to the subclavian and the right common carotid. Then the left common carotid comes off separately in this middle vessel. And then the subclavian, the left subclavian comes off in this um, separate vessel. So that's an important thing to remember um, when we're talking about the aorta and what sort of mischief can happen with dissection and things like that. Um, this is the anatomy of the upper extremity uh, vascular system. I want to re uh, remind you that just like the brain has uh, the circle of Willis, so that if there's a blockage in one area, the blood flow will continue around it through the other side. Um, that same thing is true in the hand circulation too. There's the deep pulmonary arch and that arch allows um, blood to continue to flow even if the radial artery, let's say, I don't know, is harvested for um, cardiac bypass surgery, as we sometimes do. Then that person can live with their ulnar artery uh, intact, supplying their uh, deep pulmonary arch. Lower extremities, you don't get that, uh, you don't get the same level of um, vascular supply. There still are arches in the feet, but um, you, you know the vascular supply can be affected much more down here by vascular disease. So important arteries to know. You have the iliacs that give rise to the femorals. Then there's the uh, common femoral artery and um, the popliteal, and then that gives rise to the uh, anterior tibial artery and the posterior tibial artery, and the perineal artery. Uh, and then that goes down to the DP, which fills the top part of the, heart, uh, top part of the foot. And then the um, uh, PT, the posterior tibialis that you hear, that you feel behind the malleolus. So it's important to know the deep veins are anything that contain that contains the name femoral, right? Or the word femoral. So the common femoral, the superficial femoral, the deep femoral, or the profunda 
the popliteal arteries, those are all the deep veins. Many of these are not. The saphenous vein, not. The anterior tibial vein, I don't believe is. Um, but the when you read a report that's looking at um, flow through the uh, venous system, you're looking for the deep veins. The deep veins are common femoral, superficial femoral, even though that seems like it shouldn't be a deep vein, it is. Uh, the deep femoral or profunda uh, vein and and the popliteal vein. Those are the, the deep veins that you should um, be on the lookout for, okay? So how do we differentiate arterial from venous disease? You probably learned these before in nursing school, but, uh, or in your clinical practice. Remember that arterial disease is painful and makes for cool, um, uh, pale extremities. Venous disease is painless, usually warm, and usually edematous extremities and often darkly pigmented all right so let's just go through these one at a time arterial disease pain with walking right we call that claudication oftentimes when we feel the extremities they're cool well there's a million things that can cause cool extremities right it could be cold out um so take that with a grain of salt but if you're examining the patient and one leg is warm one leg is cool then maybe that's uh, an important clue Decreased or absent pulses, that's very important, right? We said that pulses are the most important part of the arterial um, assessment. No edema. We don't see edema in um, arterial insufficiency as a rule, but write it in pencil, right? It's a rule, but write it in pencil. Um, pale skin, because there's not enough blood getting there, or ruber, this red skin, um, because of chronic inflammation and not getting, you know, an adequate blood supply. Um, thin skin, shiny skin, loss of hair, all goes along with arterial disease. And then when patients get ulcerations with arterial disease, it's typically at pressure points where shoes rub or, uh, or there's some other, uh, you know, pressure that's exerted on that, um, spot of skin. Venous disease is different. It's usually painless. Even if they have big, ugly wounds on their lower extremities, uh, when it's venous in nature, it's usually painless. Warm, pulses are normal. Even if you can't feel them because of all the edema, you can get pulses with uh, Dopplers. Um, darkly pigmented skin happens as a result of chronic venous insufficiency. And, uh, and that's a telltale sign, okay? So here are some examples of arterial insufficiency. Here you see a pressure spot from the patient's shoe that's wearing into here. The skin just can't heal because of that chronic pressure. This is um, lower extremity that is pallorous, has pallor. I don't know how to say that, but um, we see pallor on this lower extremity because there's not enough blood flow getting to it. Right, and here we see some blotchiness from uh, some chronic ischemia to the uh, to these toes here. That um, picture that you see here, this deep red, when you have the patient's feet down in a dependent position, uh, that's ruber, and that uh, discoloration goes along with um, arterial disease, as do these ulcers here that are ischemic and at the site of pressure points. Then of course we have gangrene of this toe. So this is chronic venous insufficiency. Notice the normal pink pigmentation or pink uh, normal pigmentation up here and it's darkly pigmented down here, you see? See how it gets like this sort of bluish, dark husky kind of color? Um, that is very characteristic of chronic venous insufficiency. The extremities are um, generous in terms of the edema there, 
and the discoloration is more down lower. Extremely late in the disease, you see still this very dark pigmentation here that's even more pronounced than you see over here. And then we see these ulcers. And these ulcers tend not to be on the uh, pressure points, but rather on the inside and outside of the um, uh, ankles, or the very lower shins. Um, here's another venous stasis ulcer, again, usually in uh, medial or lateral aspects of the lower extremities. Painless, doesn't hurt at all, um, but these patients usually need a lot of um, uh, pressure support. The una boots are very helpful for them. They're pressurized wraps. They keep the uh, venous pressure low so that the blood can return to the heart. Earlier, though, we see things like varicose veins. So these are spider veins that you see, and then these varicose veins that pop out. I'm sorry, this picture is of such terrible quality, but you get the idea. You see this not when the patient's laying down, but rather when they're standing up. And when they're standing up, um, the vein, uh, of course, fills with blood, and it tries to regurgitate backwards through the uh, failing valves and that causes the veins to stick out. A DVT is a life-threatening uh, thing. If we see a patient who has one leg that is substantially larger than the other, particularly if there's pain in the calves, um, uh, or in this calf, the affected side, then that is a very urgent medical situation that needs addressed and you need to get a uh, venous duplex to assess that. Um, this is a dramatic example. It's not usually this dramatic. Uh, usually it's a clinical uh, suspicion that we send patients to get a uh, venous duplex and then that's confirmatory. It doesn't usually look this dramatic. Um, this Homan sign that we all learn in nursing school, I, I don't know any vascular surgeon who loves uh, who actually feels and, and repro tries to reproduce the Homan sign because you can knock that clot off, it goes to the lung, and then you have a pulmonary embolism. So not a good idea to, um, uh, to do that. If you suspect uh, DVT, just leave it alone, get the patient uh, a study of their uh, venous system looking for um, uh, DVT, and we'll deal with it that way. One other thing, remember I mentioned the uh, the pulmonary artery, uh, the the deep pulmonary arch. This is a test called the Allen test to test to see how the uh, circulation is. In this case, we have the patient um, uh, make a fist with our fingers over the radial artery and the ulnar artery that blanches all the skin like this, right? And then if we let up on the ulnar artery, in this case, it fills this with blood. So we can see nice blood here, but we don't see anything flowing past that pulmonary arch into the first finger or the thumb. So this Allen test shows that there's um, uh, a blockage in that deep pulmonary arch. And for that reason, we want to really protect this radial artery and make sure that it doesn't, um, doesn't disappear on us. Another thing we sometimes see is this uh, purple toe syndrome. This is a function of embolic events, uh, cardiac catheterization or interventional radiology procedures where a piece of cholesterol may uh, fly off and go downstream. And here you can see multiple emboli that have gone off and caused these purple toes uh, and this other uh, discoloration to occur.